Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. This week's Unpacking Scholarship episode is actually myself reading a paper that I have modified that I originally wrote and presented for a conference in 2017. So the, this episode is titled Depression, Suicide, and Computer Science Education. Now, the reason why I'm releasing this particular episode on this date is because September in 2020 is National Suicide Prevention Month. This week that this is releasing is National Suicide Prevention Week, and September 10th of 2020 is World Suicide Prevention Day. Now, just as a disclaimer in the show notes and in every slide of the YouTube video that this is being displayed on is a link to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is one 800 Two seven three eight two five five. And again, this is in the show notes, and it is in every single slide. If you're watching this on the YouTube uh, channel, and if you are at all experiencing any signs of depressions or suicidality, I highly recommend reaching out to either that number or some other healthcare professional who can help you. Now, as I mentioned, some slides on the YouTube link. So this session is a little bit different. I am not going to be editing this particular podcast episode, so if I mess up saying a sentence, I'll restate it. If the doorbell rings, I will ignore it. If um, things get raw in terms of emotion, I will do my best to try and speak clearly because I have not yet been able to read through this paper without kind of breaking down at some point, either by getting choked up or just straight up crying. And the reason why I'm sharing this to you raw and unedited is because I want you to see that this is an important topic and it is something that we need to talk about. And I don't want to hide my emotions around this topic from anybody because this is something that has impacted the majority of my life. I also want to note that in the second and third vignettes in this particular episode, I use the singular they and its derivative there, along with gender neutral pseudonyms to maintain anonymity within this paper. So these vignettes are compilations of various students I'm aware of and stories and teachers and are not intended to represent any single educator, student, or story. Okay, so with all that being said, I'm going to start with the paper itself. And again, on the YouTube channel, if you watch the YouTube version, it has some slides that kind of emphasize with some visuals some of the key important things about this. However, you can listen to the entire episode in podcast format, and it should hopefully make sense as long as I can clearly articulate what it is that I am saying. Okay, so the purpose of this paper is to spread awareness about depression and suicide in order to help computer science educators support students with coping with depression and suicidal ideation. The subject matter within this paper is deeply personal to me and has been difficult to write about. I spent the larger part of a decade coping with suicidal ideation and depression. However, I have used my experiences to help others through depression and suicidal thoughts and hope this paper encourages current listeners or viewers to do the same. This paper is formatted into the following sections. One, a vignette on my own experiences coping with depression and suicide. Two, statistics on depression and suicide as it relates to various populations computer science educators work with. And three, a vignette of a computer science educator helping a student through depression and suicidal thoughts. Four, risk factors and warning signs. Five, suggestions for providing support. Six, a vignette from a computer science educator's perspectives on a uh, student who committed suicide, and seven, some closing thoughts. So again, I want to reiterate that this is a heavy topic, and if you ever need support, reach out to a mental health care uh, professional or simply contact 1-800-273-8255, which in the United States is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Okay, vignette one, Jared, that's me. So I spent months thinking about how I would kill myself. I frequently debated the likelihood of, su of success, amount of cleanup, and how much my decision might affect others. With my dad being a police officer and former SWAT team member, 
a gun may have provided a quick method for achieving my goals. However, I honestly had no idea if he even owned a gun, as I seldom saw him with one. Pills or chemicals provided the opportunity to kill myself from the inside out, but I was afraid my stomach would reject such poisons, and failure was not an option. I was worried cutting my wrists would affect my ability to play the drums, which is an ironic concern considering the intended result. On several occasions while driving by myself, I debated shifting lanes into oncoming highway traffic. Despite my mental instability, I reasoned it was unfair to take from others what I wanted to take from myself. I tried killing myself through pure exhaustion by pushing myself to extremes, walking across streets without looking in either directions, or simply crying myself to sleep, hoping I would never wake. After months of ideating, I settled on a method. Most teenagers I knew seemed to pay little attention to the concrete medians used to protect vehicles from falling off raised freeway overpass entrances. The concrete divides scattered across long straightaways often utilize crash barriers to lessen the impact of a potential collision. Although, the intended, although intended for safer driver conditions, these concrete medians became my method of choice for completing suicide. The concrete divide I was unfalteringly careening toward on a now unknown evening, contained no such life-saving technologies and had a long straightaway serving as my runway into non-existence. I gripped the steering wheel, screamed a long obscenity, and applied more pressure to the gas pedal. My car's engine could assist with the process no more than it already had. I took a deep breath and unbuckled my seatbelt. Its design purpose lowered the success rate of my plan. My car's engine was straining to keep up, keep up with the heavy foot on the pedal. The speedometer was reaching its limits, well over 100 miles per hour. Although slightly obscured by a muddle of tears and headlights from oncoming traffic in the opposing lane, my carefully selected target was in sight. My internal struggles would finally be over. In hindsight, there are no immediately identifiable risk factors correlated with the few times I nearly attempted suicide, as previously described. Despite my chronic depression, I had a happy childhood with great parents, friends, and family members. My likelihood for attempting suicide increased slowly over the years as my depression worsened, first one reason and then another, chipping away my resolve to live, compounding my desire to die. These thoughts consumed my time and energy more than I tried to let on, and I morphed into a walking shell of a human being whose existence was devoted to whatever could keep my mind occupied, largely music and video games. I was fortunate to have started percussion lessons and band classes a little over a year prior to onset of my gradual descent into depression and suicidal ideation. Although I love making music for music's sake, practicing rudimental percussion became one of my coping mechanisms. Music making allowed me to temporarily suppress my thoughts of self-harm, so I found ways to practice as much as I could. For example, I carried a spring-loaded doorknob in my pocket so I could work on left-hand rotation for traditional grip while walking between classes, a practice technique I learned in high school from a world champion snare drummer. So it must be good, right? I even had a pair of drumsticks I kept in my car so I could drum on the steering wheel at red lights. On the few occasions where a doorknob or sticks were not in my hands, I utilized visualization techniques to mentally practice various exercises and show music. Each moment absorbed in developing my abilities and understandings as a musician was a moment away from thoughts of self-harm. My experiences with music literally saved my life. Although practicing temporarily suppressed my thoughts of self-harm, and working with other musicians provided a sense of belonging where I otherwise felt disconnected or unknown, some of the music instruction I received exacerbated my thoughts of self-harm. In particular, some of the music educators would joke about how a particular musical passage sounded so bad that, quote, they would rather throw themselves off the top of the stadium than listen to another repetition, end quote. These jokes resurfaced my own thoughts of self-harm in an environment where I sought to escape them. In another ensemble I was required to participate in for school, one of the instructors treated me in a manner that led to my psychiatrist prescribing anxiety medication to help diminish the severe anxiety attacks 
I had before each of our required rehearsals. Unfortunately, incidents like these were not isolated, nor were they infrequent. Ultimately, it is because of my amazing experiences with music and education, and some of the unfortunate instruction that accompany these experiences, I decided to pursue degrees in music education and eventually work in computer science education in order to help others who might experience similar struggles as I. It is with this paper I hope to expand awareness of the pervasiveness of suicidality and depression among the students we work with, so our field can work together to help those who feel alone with their struggles. The following section describes statistics on suicidal ideation and depression in school-aged youth. So statistics on suicide. Worldwide, suicide is the leading cause of mortality for adolescents as an estimated 800,000 people complete suicide each year, averaging to 2,192 suicides per day, or one completed suicide every 45 seconds. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death among all ages in the United States and is among the top three causes of death for U.S. teens. More teens and young adults die by suicide than from all other illnesses combined. According to a report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 41,149 people committed suicide in 2013 in the United States. This averages to 12.6 suicides per 100,000 people, 113 suicides per day, or one completed suicide every 13 minutes. However, suicidality is even more pervasive than these numbers appear. As some estimate, there are 100 to 200 attempts for every completed youth suicide. And others note, childhood death by suicide are underreported due to a reluctance to indicate a child completed suicide. A 2013 nationwide study by the CDC indicates one in six high school students seriously considered suicide. One in seven students created a plan for committing suicide. One in 13 students reported trying to commit suicide. And one in 37 students made an attempt requiring medical attention in the year preceding a survey. A 2007 youth risk behavior survey reported similar, slightly smaller percentages. While adolescents between ages 12 and 17 have a national suicide rate of 5.18 suicides per 100,000 people, Youth between ages 5 and 11 have a national suicide rate of 0.17 suicides per 100,000 people. Suicide rates vary among different demographics. So for example, worldwide, 4.1 females per 100,000 complete suicide, while 10.5 males per 100,000 complete suicide. And I don't have data outside of that false binary, so my apologies for that. In China, southern India, and Singapore, this tendency is reversed. For ages 5 through 14, one in every 2,000 females or one in every 1,111 males commit suicide each year. In the United States, adolescent females are more likely to report suicidal ideation, while adolescent males are four times more likely to die by suicide. For example, in the United States, between 1993 and 2012, 553 boys and 104 girls completed suicide. Suicidal ideation, or the thoughts of harming or killing oneself, in adolescence is somewhere between 12 and 30%, and peaks around 12 years of age for boys and 14 years of age for girls. Between 1993 and 1997, suicide ranked 14th as cause of death among black children aged 5 through 11, but ranked 9th between 2008 and 2012. Among Hispanic students in grades 9 through 12, one in five students seriously considered committing suicide. One in six students created a plan for committing suicide. One in nine students reported trying to commit suicide. And one in 24 students made an attempt requiring medical attention in the year preceding a survey. Native and indigenous ethnic minority teenagers between the ages of 15 and 19 
tend to have a higher suicide rate in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the United States. In Australia, indigenous teenage females were 5.8 times more likely to complete suicide than non-indigenous peers, with a rate of 18.7 suicide, suicides per 100,000 indigenous people, compared with 3.2 suicides per 100,000 non-indigenous people. Indigenous males were 4.4 times more likely to complete suicide than non-indigenous peers, with 43.4 suicides per 100,000 indigenous people compared with 9.9 .9 suicides per 100,000 non-indigenous people. In the United States, Native American and Alaskan teenagers are 1.7 times more likely to die by suicide. Method for suicide varies by access to means, gender, and age. In the United States, the three leading methods of suicide among youth were firearms, hanging, and poisoning. Firearms were the, was the method of choice in 45% of suicide cases. However, the CDC notes firearms was not the most common method for males. Excuse me. However, the CDC notes firearms was the most common method for males, while poisoning was the most common method for females. In most other Western countries, the most common method are hanging and suicide by vehicular exhaustion, followed by suicide by firearms and poisoning. In some Eastern countries, pesticides are the predominant method of choice. While some believe stricter gun and pesticide laws assist with the decreasing suicide rates, others believe such restrictions lead to substitutions for other methods. For example, in children aged 5 through 11, Hanging or suffocation were the most prevalent method of suicide between 1993 and 2012, accounting for 514 of the 657 reported deaths by suicide. A survey of teachers in Queensland, Australia revealed one in three teachers were exposed to at least one student committing suicide during their tenure as a classroom teacher. Of these teachers, nearly one half were exposed to one student suicide. One in four were exposed to two student suicides. And one in three were exposed to three or more student suicides. The suicide statistics among school-aged children present a need for classroom teachers and support staff to be aware of risk factors, warning signs, and methods for support. However, studies on teachers' knowledge of suicide indicate many feel underprepared to help others through suicidal ideation. So let's talk about stats of depression. So feeling depressed differs from clinical depression. Clinical depression lasts at least two weeks in length and may include a variety of detrimental uh, symptoms. A typical depressive episode among children and adults lasts between seven and nine months with a 40% recurrence rate within two years and a 70% recurrence rate within five years. However, chronic depression can exist for years. Unlike adults, depressed children are less likely to engage in serious suicide attempts, but instead demonstrate other symptoms. These symptoms can negatively impact a person's life. For example, depressed adolescents are 3.5% less likely to graduate from high school, and 6% less likely to enroll in college than those without depression. Unlike suicidal acts requiring medical treatment, depression can remain unnoticed or underreported, as many people suffering from depression do not seek treatment. For example, Riston found nearly one in eight university music students who responded to a survey received treatment for depression. However, one in 11 of those suffering from depression symptoms did not seek treatment. The tendency for people suffering from depression symptoms to not seek treatment may contribute to discrepancies in reported rates of depression among various populations. Depression affects nearly 340 million people worldwide, including 18 million people in the United States. Callan, Hallen, and Puskar estimate between 1 in 17 and 1 in 11 adolescents ages 12 to 18 have major depression while Brent and Bermaher suggest about 1 in 20 students and 1 in 100 of children have depression. Others estimate comparable ranges among children and teenagers. However, Mary et al. suggests by the age of 19, between a fifth and a quarter of young people have suffered from a depressive disorder. 
major depressive disorders among children occurs at the same rates for girls and boys, whereas adolescent and adult females are twice as likely to have depression than males. However, females are 60% more likely to receive treatment than males, and black adolescents are 50% less likely to receive treatments. So again, different demographics matter. Given the pervasiveness of both depression and suicidality, computer science educators are likely to encounter students who could benefit from a helping hand. The following vignette describes how a computer science educator helped a student. Vignette 2, Chris and Elliot. It is amazing how context can alter one's perception of time. Chris was making the same relatively boring drive they made multiple times during the week. From an outsider's perspective, the trip might appear as any other. However, today's trip had urgency that stretched time in an almost tauntingly manner. It was shortly after school when Chris was updating their website with new projects to prepare for tomorrow morning's class when they received a text message. Although on vibrate for the school day, the phone gave a familiar, muffled chime in Chris's pocket. Chris used an app to bypass vibration or silent modes if someone called multiple times in case of emergency. However, the app also allowed anyone on an emergency contact list to immediately ring through. Although the people on the emergency contact list infrequently contacted Chris, Chris always carried a phone charger wherever they went, and never let the phone's battery fall below 50%. Chris had an agreement with their school's principal that if someone on the emergency contact list reached out to Chris, they would need someone to cover their classes while Chris was on the phone call. The text was from Elliot, one of the people on the app's emergencies contact list. Elliot was your average kid with good friends, a caring family, and a healthy amount of uncertainty about future career aspirations in a variety of fields. Elliot liked playing video games until late hours of the night, replicating the vocal qualities of their favorite screamo bands, showing off the amount of mud caked on their vehicle after off-roading, and prefer performing in a variety of music ensembles. Chris had worked with Elliot for a number of years in an after-school coding club at another school. Over time, Chris began to notice a change in Elliot. Elliot's grades dropped a little over time, a result attributed to an increase in advanced placement courses, but not so low to cause any concern. The amount of drama between Elliot and their friends fluctuated, fluctuated like a roller coaster, but remained typical for the age group. Despite everyone being busy throughout the year, family life remained stable and supportive. Elliot had lost weight over the years, a likely consequence from an increase in physical activity. Drugs and alcohol did not appear to be the source of the gradual change. Chris vaguely remembered overhearing parts of a story Elliot told years ago about a distant family member's addiction to some now forgotten substance that caused Elliot to avoid even taking anything for a headache. Elliot's inner crisis revealed itself not as a signal for help, but rather a gradual surrender to life itself. Something about Elliot's eyes gave it away. A certain amount of light had faded away. Along with it, Elliot's previously unfaltering drive for learning how to code. Chris indirectly reached out to the coding club Elliot participated in by sharing brief stories about how Chris previously suffered from depression and how speaking with a counselor and friends helped. These stories may have come across as, when I was your age, battle wounds, but Chris only told these stories when they thought someone could benefit from hearing them. These stories and advice often related to computer science. For example, making statements such as, like coding a program, life comes with many bugs and challenges, but it gets better with consistent effort and problem solving. When Elliot's eyes appeared particularly dull, Chris, Chris would reach out by saying, if you ever need someone to talk to, know I'm willing to lend an ear. Months before the unexpected text message, Chris met with their school's counselor to discuss subtle changes in Elliot that concern Chris. Chris shared experiences with depression and suicidal thoughts when Chris was Elliot's age, as well as how Chris, along with other counselors, helped students through their own struggles. Chris's intention was to recommend the counselor meet with Elliot to potentially work through some feelings Elliot may be struggling with. After this meeting, Elliot started seeing a counselor multiple times a week and began taking antidepressants at the recommendation of their psychiatrist. The pharmaceuticals acted like sandpaper on Elliot's emotions by filing down peaks and valleys of emotion into a stable but numb state. 
Although not ideal, this state of mind and resulting side effects were better than the emotions that led to the prescription. In one of the counseling sessions, the counselor asked Elliot to create a list of people to contact if they ever had suicidal thoughts. Elliot promised to contact everyone on the list if things got bad. Chris was the first on that list. In the text message Chris received, Elliot indicated not achieving something they had been working toward for months. Although Chris responded with validation of Elliot's feelings, Elliot's reaction appeared disproportionately large. After a few exchanges of encouragement by Chris and the hastily retorted shutdown by Elliot, Elliot indicated the self-ascribed overreaction might have resulted from not taking medication for the past few weeks. Chris picked up the phone and called Elliot. On the other end of the line, Elliot was nearly silent and short on breath. Chris could hear a high amount of anxiety and hopelessness in Elliot's voice and gently encouraged Elliot to slow down the breathing as everything was going to be okay in the end. Elliot complied, but was worried they would do something they couldn't, that couldn't be taken back. Elliot was currently standing in their school's parking lot after school hours, relatively safe for the time being. Hoping the fear would not show in their voice, Chris asked if Elliot could stay there and wait for Chris to arrive and speak in person. Elliot made a promise to not leave, but did not want to talk on the phone while Chris made the drive over. While driving, Chris tried to contact others near Elliot who might help. However, the after-school hours made it difficult to find anyone near Elliot. So along that drive, Chris made a phone call to a 24-hour suicide hotline for advice. The calming voice on the other end of the line asked questions about the situation in order to best understand how to help. Although the conversation helped district, although the conversation helped distract Chris from wondering if Elliot would keep their promise to stay safe until Chris's arrival, the drive seemed to stretch on longer than usual. Upon arrival, Chris could immediately sense Elliot was in an agitated state. Elliot's eyes were frantically jerking back and forth as if searching for a lost object. Responses, if any, were short and firm. Elliot made it clear they did not want to speak to the other person on the phone. However, they agreed Chris could act as a messenger between both parties. The suicide hotline in Elliot spoke through Chris for what seemed like minutes, but lasted over an hour. By then, Elliot's pacing slowed. The anguish in their voice became equal parts disappointment and embarrassment. Elliot's discourse shifted toward thinking about the future and began to thank both Chris and the voice on the other phone. On the other end of the phone. A voice that Elliot never heard. Although all parties agreed the crisis was averted and that regular check-ins by Elliot and their counselor and Chris would follow until there was no more cause for concern. This was not the first time Chris worked with healthcare professionals to help another person in this manner nor would it be the last. Okay, the next section of the paper is risk factors and warning signs. A variety of risk factors can contribute to depression and suicide ideation. These include mood or psychological disorders such as depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, anhedonia, low self-esteem, hopelessness, psychosis, conduct disorder or impulsivity, externalizing problems, eating disorders and other forms of self-harm, substance abuse such as alcohol and drugs, prenatal drug exposure, social pressure, isolation, motivation to die or escape, socioeconomic difficulties due to recessions or unemployment, sexual orientation, local suicide epidemics and amount of exposure to suicide, physical or chronic illness, loss of relationships due to death, divorce, or living apart, general family discord, poor parent-child connection or low parental supervision, intragenerational or cultural classes, clashes with parents, familial history of suicide and psychopathology, child maltreatment, associations with deviant peer groups, ease of access to lethal methods, the number of barriers to accessing mental health treatment, and a discomfort or support systems. Of all these risk factors, the greatest risk factor for suicidality is previous suicide attempts. Having any one of these symptoms might not indicate depression or suicidal ideation. 
However, the level and severity of psychiatric disorders positively correlates with suicidal risk. In addition, a positive correlation exists between depression and suicide with two or more simultaneous disorders or illnesses, an effect known as co comorbidity. Potential warning signs for depression and suicidal ideation may include the following changes in behavior. An increase in impulsivity or aggression, anxiety, irritability, and frustration, lacking cooperation, running away or threatening to run away, withdrawing from family or friends, changes in quantity of sleep or food consumed, lower academic achievement or scores, general loss of interest, fatigue or loss of energy, Diminished ability to concentrate, neglect of personal appearance or interests, reported aches and pains, talking or writing about suicide or death, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, hurting oneself, or substance abuse. In my own experiences with suicidal ideation and depression, I made efforts to hide my warning signs from many close friends and family members because I was afraid of what others might think if I shared my suicidal thoughts. In the second vignette, Chris was able to identify warning signs and worked with healthcare professionals to provide a multitude of support for Elliot after noticing subtle changes over a prolonged period of time. Unlike most classroom teachers, many computer science educators have the opportunity to work with a student over many months or years, which may allow us to identify warning signs and provide support as needed. However, computer science educators may find it difficult to identify warning signs when working with hundreds of students or focusing too much on academic learning outcomes. Unfortunately, in one, of, in one study of high school teachers, nearly one in two teachers concerned a student might be suicidal reported they did nothing. I'm going to repeat that statement for emphasis. Nearly one in two teachers concerned a student might be suicidal reported they did nothing. Sheftal et al. also found suicide intent was disclosed to another person before death with time for intervention in nearly one in three completed suicides. So given these stats, how might educators and communities provide support for those displaying warning signs for depression or suicidal ideation? Next section of the paper, providing support. Children and early adolescents may not initiate a conversation about their internal struggles, so computer science educators can assist by responding to potential warning signs. In particular, computer science educators can assist by recommending students speak with a school counselor, psychologist, or music therapist, or, as in the case of the second vignette, recommend a healthcare professional reach out to the student. Some students may feel uncomfortable visiting a mental health care professional on their own. One option for addressing this concern is asking a student if they would feel more comfortable if a trusted adult were also present. If knowledgeable of the local and school reporting protocols and laws, and if computer science educators feel comfortable doing so, we may lend a listening ear, validate their emotions, and let the person know we are there for them. Otherwise, immediately connect students with healthcare professionals. When listening to students, it may be appropriate to share personal examples of having worked through similar thoughts or emotions with a healthcare professional. However, take care to maintain a focus on active listening rather than shifting the focus to the conversation uh, about your own experiences. Whenever a conversation like this occurs or there is a perceived cause for concern, we can speak with our school's counselor, psychologist, or music therapist for further resources and advice. When a school's healthcare professional is unavailable, we can reach out to organizations such as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for free resources and confidential 24-7 hotline, much like the hotline Chris called for professional advice in the second vignette. The sooner a student in need has access to resources and support, the better. On an individual level, computer science educators might work with counselors to identify and avoid words that exacerbate negative states of mind or acts of self-harm. For example, when the music educator in the, in the introductory vignette joked about completing suicide, contemplating suicide during the rehearsal, this triggered my own thoughts of self-harm. As another example, one of the students I previously worked with would engage in bulimic activities when they heard the word perfect. 
Avoiding this one word assisted with their recovery process. For classes, computer science educators might work with local healthcare professionals to develop lessons or projects incorporating interpersonal problem solving, building positive emotional and interpersonal skills, fostering awareness of mental uh, disorders as common and treatable, and promoting the acceptability of seeking treatment. Computer science classes or programs may find ways to incorporate these lessons or projects within team building experiences. CS classes or programs may also assist with developing a sense of community or connectedness, an important proactive factor for suicidal, excuse me, an important protective factor for suicidal youth. By exploring essential questions such as, how might CS develop a sense of community? Schools interested in providing support for teachers should move beyond raising awareness and following protocols, but increase general knowledge and abilities for working with students coping with suicide ideation and depression. This includes program for early adolescents during high suicide ideation, rather than only during high school years during high mortality rate. Schools might also partner with local healthcare professionals to offer community education events or create distributable educational resources. Communities may also assist by increasing access to or funding for research on healthcare treatment or by regulating access to means such as firearms, pesticides, and or medications. Although the suggestions for support may help, there are no guarantees each method of support will work for everyone. For instance, side effects from antidepressants can cause even worse symptoms to arise, and some intervention programs may increase depressive symptoms. In addition, children who commit suicide often act on impulse rather than adolescents who plan suicide over longer periods of time. So warning signs might go unnoticed. The following vignette describes how even when people work together to help someone through a su suicidal ideation, warning signs may go unnoticed. This is vignette three, Alex and Sam. Sam was introducing a project to their class when someone caught Excuse me, let me start this again. Sorry, this is the hardest section for me to read. Sam was introducing a project to their class when something caught Sam's attention. Alex was sitting in the back of the room pretending to hang a noose around their neck while everyone else watched the project demonstration. Although Sam initially interpreted the act as a harsh commentary on how little Alex enjoyed the project, a glimmer of sadness in Alex's eyes gave away a deeper meaning. Alex was so young. Sam had the class begin working on the project and they discreetly asked Alex to enter their office attached to the computer lab. Alex reluctantly agreed and appeared to assume impending scolding. Sam stood in front of the office window in order to monitor the classroom while speaking with Alex. You're not in trouble, Sam said. I just want to check to see if everything is all right. Alex immediately burst into tears. A relative of Alex had recently passed away and Alex felt very sad. Sam validated Alex's feelings, and the two of them spoke moments longer. Class was almost over. Sam just wanted to give Alex a hug and say everything was going to be okay. When the classroom teacher arrived, Sam spoke in private about the brief conversation with Alex. The class stood there and talked quietly about their plans after school, seemingly unaware of the private conversation. Alex's classroom teacher apologetically indicated Alex was having a rough day and was not surprised of the uncovered catalyst. The sudden changes in behavior now made sense. Once the class had left, Sam walked to the principal's office at a moderate pace. Sam donned a goofy smile accompanied by a wave while walking by other classes in the hallway, causing quiet giggles and a wave from dozens of tiny hands. When Sam arrived at the principal's office, Sam gave a look of concern and requested to shut the door to speak in private. The principal knew Sam had a history of identifying kids who needed to speak with the school's counselor so they attentively listened. They both agreed Alex needed to speak with the school's counselor before school let out, a deadline rapidly approaching. Words cannot describe the amount of uncertainty and fear when concerned about a child's life. Over the next few weeks, Sam made a point to check in on Alex with those who knew about the conversation they had. Things were getting better. Actually, things were getting significantly better. The behavior issues diminished, and Alex shed no more tears. 
The weekly conversations with the school counselor appeared, appeared to be helping. On one particular class, Sam felt that they could see the, the light in Alex's eyes again. Alex was smiling and laughing with friends while they shared their latest coding projects with each other. And Sam wanted to tell Alex how well Alex was doing in class, but missed the opportunity while talking with other kids before they left for home. Sam made a mental note to speak with Alex about it before the next class. Sam arrived at school the following morning and noticed some teachers quietly speaking in the corner of the multi-purpose room. The look on their faces was a mixture of disbelief, reflection, and sadness. Words cannot describe what it felt like when Sam heard the source of their emotional conversation. Alex had completed suicide. Closing thoughts. Every student in a CS program or community has their own reason for participation, which may include a desire to help, excuse me, which may include a desire to obtain a job in a CS-related career, pure hedonic enjoyment through mod practices, or even a healthy escape from a variety of struggles. This paper began with a vignette highlighting some of my own struggles with depression and suicidal ideation. My experiences with music began as a curiosity, morphed into a mental escape, and slowly transitioned into a method for helping others through both music education and computer science education. The other two vignettes highlight perspectives from computer science educators during critical moments when working with someone suffering from depression or suicidal ideation. However, the day-to-day -day warning signs and risk factors may be less recognizable. The actions taken by Chris and Sam provide some examples of the ways we can respond to potential warning signs in order to support students who may be experiencing depression or suicidal thoughts. Chris initially reached out to Elliot through indirect anecdotes while addressing a small group of students in an after-school coding club. However, Elliot's depression appeared to worsen. So Chris worked with Elliot's counselor and Elliot to provide a support team that regularly checked in. Sam, on the other hand, immediately sought help with the school's principal and counselor because Alex's warning signs indicated a greater risk for self-harm than Elliot's depression. In my own experiences working with youth in a variety of contexts, I feel it is better to offer support for those who may not need any than to reach out to someone who is in need of support. At the very least, reaching out on a misidentified warning sign may encourage future referrals of friends in need of support. And it lets a person know that they have an adult in their life who can validate their feelings and guide them to necessary support when times are difficult. In addition, when I'm uncertain if someone is displaying warning signs or if someone does not feel comfortable sharing with me, I immediately contacted my school's counselor to ask if they can provide support. Considering the aforementioned prevalence of suicide and depression among youth, Computer science educators should extend best efforts to help others who might need guidance or support. Every year since starting my career in education, I have identified several people in a variety of contexts and demographics and grade levels, K through graduate, who benefited from some support for either depression or suicidal ideation. Given the statistics of both depression and suicidality, it is likely each of us will encounter multiple opportunities to extend a hand for support. Our profession could further assist others by not only extending support, but by encouraging diversity in the ways students express themselves through the projects they create in our CS classes. These efforts may not only help others create with and learn computer science, but may save lives. I want to thank you very much for making this Far and for listening and for watching. As a reminder, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline if you ever need somebody to speak with. The number again is 1 800 273 8255. My only request for this episode is just please consider sharing this. The stats suggest that this is something we're all going to have to grapple with at some point during our career. And I think this message needs to be shared widely. So thank you for considering doing that, and I hope you stay tuned next week for another episode where I'll actually be 
creating a supercut of various interviews that have been done in the past and kind of combining all the ways that uh, the guests have recommended taking care of themselves and staving off burnout to kind of piggyback onto this particular message. So again, thank you so much for listening. That was hard for me to read. Um, I hope you got something out of it. And I um, hope you're all staying safe and are having a wonderful week.